Hello everyone, I'm very excited to be here today to give you this keynote on the role of randomization in trustworthy machine learning. I'd like to thank the organizers of the workshop for inviting me. The talk is going to be in two parts today. The first part is going to address robustness in machine learning, and then the second part, privacy in machine learning. And from these two parts, I hope to contrast how one area has been able to adapt randomization to improve uh, privacy, whereas the second area in robustness hasn't been as successful in applying randomization to improve the robustness of machine learning models. So let's start with this question of robustness, and in particular adversarial examples. So here we have uh, a common, uh, st commonly studied vulnerability of machine learning models, which is that when we take test inputs that machine learning models initially correctly classified, we can compute perturbations of these test inputs that then force the models to misclassify these inputs. The way that we obtain these perturbations is by maximizing the error of the model through a graded descent search, which gives us a perturbation that we can then apply to the input. So as a way to defend against adversarial examples, there have been a number of defenses that proposed adding pre-processing steps such as here, as I've illustrated, rotations of the images in the hope that an adversarial example has to generalize to all of the transformations uh, in order to evade the classifier. So for instance here, we would take the original image and apply a number of random rotations to this image before we pass these images, these rotated images, to the classifier. And so the question is, does this strategy make the attack any harder? This is exactly what we study in the paper that I'm going to present in the first part of the talk, which was co-authored with Yue Gao, Ilya Shumailov, and Kesem Fawaz. I'd like to acknowledge that the slides that I'm using were uh, created by Yue Gao, who is the first author of this paper. In fact, if we take a look at the literature, we'll see that there have been a number of papers that introduce stochastic defenses as a way to improve the robustness of machine learning models to adversarial examples. And as these different defenses were introduced, we have seen other papers that introduce adaptive attacks that target these defenses and show how to break these defenses, uh, show, sort of showing that the randomization that is introduced does not reliably increase the robustness of the machine learning models. That said, there are newer proposals uh, that are continuing to uh, suggest that we may see an increase in robustness of machine learning models through the introduction of these stochastic preprocessing defenses. So it remains unclear whether randomization can be used to improve the robustness of machine learning models. What have we learned so far? Well, we know that adaptive attacks are becoming very hard to design and evaluate. As I just mentioned, uh, we, we, for instance, have uh, new proposals that have been made recently, such as DiffPure, which require literally hours to evaluate the prediction of a model on a single input without proper uh, access to high-end GPUs. And so this makes it very difficult for academics and in general researchers to evaluate the claims of robustness that are being made. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, but if we look at other examples like BART, it took over three years to break this defense, uh, and that required working on a smaller scale data set. So what does this mean about stochastic uh, preprocessing defenses? Well, the fundamental weaknesses remain unknown. We don't understand why randomness does not provide robustness as we expected, which is sort of illustrated by the series of adaptive attacks that have been proposed against uh, stochastic defenses. And we also don't understand how to avoid the pitfalls of existing stochastic preprocessing defenses. And this is what we are going to try and learn from uh, this paper uh, that I'm presenting now, which is how should we uh, understand the fundamental limitations of stochastic defenses such that we can successfully introduce randomization as a means to improve the robustness of machine learning models. So let's take a look at these limitations of 
stochastic preprocessing defenses. The first one that we identify in the paper is the lack of sufficient randomness. So let me explain what I mean here. If you remember at the uh, first slide on this paper, I introduced this idea of the expectation over transformation, meaning that we are now trying to synthesize adversarial examples that are adversarial over a chosen distribution of transformation. So for instance, you could think of all of these randomized rotations. Once this was uh, initially introduced, it was then adapted as an adaptive attack in the evaluation of defenses that involve randomization, okay? And so here, what we first ask in the paper is, is this evaluation of robustness through EOT, expectations over transformation, sufficient to understand the robustness of machine learning models that use stochastic defenses, okay? And the answer is no. The reason is that most stochastic defenses, in fact, lack sufficient randomness to require that the adversary use EOT. So what we found in particular is that if we take a much simpler attack without expectations over transformation, simply a variant of uh, projected gradient descent, PGD, we are still able to evade these defenses despite the fact that they are stochastic. So this is what you can see in this table. On the left, we have the adaptive evaluation with expectations over transformations. And here, this is our attack without expectations over transformation. And you can see here that the success rate was indeed 100% for the attack with expectations over transformation. But our attack without expectations over transformation is also able to evade the different defenses that are stochastic defenses with success rates close to 100%, despite the fact, again, that it does not use expectations over transformation. How did we achieve this? Well, we simply increase the number of attack iterations. Here you can see 40,000 instead of 100. And we also decrease alpha, uh, which is the learning rate. And so this is perhaps surprising, but what this shows is that standard attacks that do not capture this expectation over transformation already perform well when it comes to attacking stochastic defenses. Again, as long as we run them for more iterations or with a smaller learning rate or both. Okay, and so what is expectations over transformation beneficial for then? Well, what we notice in our study is that expectations over transformation become useful when there is very significant randomness being added by the stochastic defense. And so this is what you can see here um, on uh, a stochastic defense, which is known as randomized smoothing. We can see here that depending on the amount of randomness that is inserted by the defense, here when the randomness is too low, there is no benefit in introducing expectations over transformation. These different rows already have a pretty high success rate, even for uh, here one single uh, transformation. Whereas here, when we have sufficient randomness, you can see that given a fixed query budget here, which combines the PGD steps, but also the number of samples for the expectations over transformation, then we do see benefits in using EOT, where here the attack success rate is higher than the attack success rate without EOT for a similar uh, query budget. So having done this, where do we now stand? Previously, we thought that we could break stochastic defenses because we were using expectations over transformation. Now we understand that we could break these stochastic defenses because they did not have sufficient randomness. Previously, we also thought that if we applied a randomized defense, the model would be more robust as long as the attack does not apply EOT. However, we now understand that even standard attacks that do not apply expectations over transformations can evade randomized defenses. And so the next natural question that comes up is, what if defenses did indeed have sufficient randomness to increase robustness?
And so this is what we will study next. And we'll see, in fact, that there is a trade-off in this setting where we introduce enough randomness between robustness and invariance of the model. And let me explain what I mean by this. The second limitation that we found in uh, stochastic defenses is that they're training the model to be invariant to the transformations that they introduce. What does this mean for a model to be invariant? Well, if we look here, the defended model, which is the model to which we apply the transformed input, should make the same prediction than the model made on the original input. And so we do this for all possible uh, transformations that are included in the randomization space. However, if we think about this, if the defendant model is invariant to the defense, then what this means is that the attack should also be the same than the attack that worked on the original model. Okay, And so this is why our intuition was initially that stochastic pre-processing defenses are not expected to work. So let's dive more into this. If we think about it uh, and take a toy example of two distributions here, two normal distributions, then what we see is that the robustness of our classifier for an epsilon ball is uh, defined as the ratio between the dotted area here on the left for one class and the right for the second class over the entire shadowed area. Okay. And so if we look at what happens with undefended classification, we see here that there is an area in the middle for which we are not able to prove any uh, robustness. We are unsure of the classifier's prediction. What do we do when we apply a randomized transformation? Well, we are essentially shifting one of these two distributions. And so we do see that the robustness increases the ratio between the dotted area again and the shadowed area is now increasing. Okay, and so the model is less vulnerable to adversarial examples. However, what this means is that we are introducing new errors into our classifier's predictions, and so we are going to train this classifier to be invariant to the transformation that we are applying to the input data. What this gives us when we look at this more carefully is we are back in the original setting where we have less uh, robustness and also we can see that here in the limit if we have perfect invariance the model that we obtain with perfect invariance and the stochastic defense is vulnerable to exactly the same attacks than the undefended model because it is equal to the undefended model itself. So what does this mean if we put all of this back together? Well, if we look at the rate of invariance, when the defendant classifier achieves higher invariance to these transformations that we're applying to the input, this allows the classifier to improve accuracy. However, when this is happening, the adversarial robustness provided by the defense strictly decreases. And in fact, we have this vicious circle where we can see that we increase randomness to improve the robustness of the classifier, but then the model becomes variant to this randomness. So this generates lower accuracy for the predictions that the model is making. We then thus fine tune the model on the defense, which means that we're introducing these transformations into the training procedure, which teaches the model to be invariant to this randomness, which in turn decreases the robustness of the classifier that we obtain. And so if we want to increase that robustness, again, we need to increase the randomness and so on. So we have this vicious circle that essentially prevents stochastic preprocessing defenses from improving robustness significantly. And the reason why is that they explicitly need to control invariance of the classifier. And in practice, we can observe this effect by looking at stochastic defenses, 
before and after they fine tune the model and looking at the attack success rate of the adversary on these uh, models before and after the fine tuning. Here, for instance, if you look at a targeted attack against randomized smoothing, which is a stochastic defense, then before we apply fine tuning, so here the red dotted line, we have very low invariance. And so the attacks are ineff ineffective. The defense is actually improving the robustness of the classifier, but that comes at a cost in terms of the accuracy of the predictions on legitimate inputs. Once we then fine tune the uh, classifier to recover some of this performance drop, then we notice that we have now higher invariance to these transformations that we apply as part of randomized smoothing, but then the attacks are more likely to succeed against this fine-tuned model. And so we see that the effect that we gained uh, for robustness has been uh, decreased and, and we are no longer having uh, a stochastic defense that meaningfully increases the robustness of the machine learning model. So what does this mean when we put all of this back together? Well, what we've learned is that stochastic defenses do not really provide inherent robustness to the model. In fact, currently the only defense that provides model robustness is adversarial training. Instead, stochastic defenses shift the input distributions through randomness and transformations. And this has an impact on the model utility. The observed robustness is a consequence of these errors that are being introduced. And if we want to remove these errors, then we teach the model how to be invariant and that decreases the robustness of the classifier. So what does this mean? Should we abandon stochastic defenses? Not necessarily. First of all, they might make black box attacks harder. Second of all, there are most likely new ways that we can exploit randomness. And in particular, we have to look for ways that decouple the robustness of the model and its invariance to these uh, randomized transformations. And so one possible uh, solution, for instance, would be to force the attack to target non-transferable subproblems, and we think this is an interesting avenue for future research. So this concludes the first part of the talk where I saw that we, by using randomization, we were not able to reliably increase the robustness of machine learning models. That said, I do think that randomization can help in achieving machine learning models that are more trustworthy, and to show you a positive example of when that is the case, I'm going to discuss next work on privacy in machine learning, where randomization has played a fundamental role in improving our ability to learn models that are privacy preserving with respect to the training data. So how can randomization help privacy in machine learning? Well, to understand why, let's take a look at a canonical definition for privacy known as differential privacy. What does differential privacy ask of an algorithm in order for this algorithm to be private? Well, if we consider an adversary, the adversary that is observing the outputs that our algorithm is making should not be able to tell whether this algorithm operates on this first data set here that contains the record in green corresponding to this individual, or if the algorithm was operating here on the second data set that does not contain that same record here, the green record, which corresponded to this individual. If we take these two, uh, these two things together, what does this mean is the adversary is observing the outputs of our algorithm and is unable to tell whether or not we included this particular record, so is not even able to tell whether or not this individual existed. And so that is why this individual would get privacy uh, out of such uh, an algorithm. What does this mean in terms of how do we prove that an algorithm is private? Well, we look at the probability that the algorithm here M makes uh, certain outputs S when given as an input the data set D. And we uh, compare these probabilities to the probabilities that the same algorithm M makes the same outputs S on a second data set D prime. And these two data sets D and D prime 
are such that they only differ by at most one record. So they could be, for instance, here d and d prime. And we prove that these probabilities are similar to one another. How similar they are is controlled by this bound here, epsilon. The smaller the value of epsilon, the stronger the privacy guarantee is because the harder it is to distinguish between these two settings here. And we prove this guarantee for all possible uh, pairs of data sets D and D prime uh, that differ by at most one record. What this means is that any individual that would participate in this data set would have a privacy guarantee. And in fact, the value of epsilon is an, uh, sort of a tool that they can use to decide whether or not they are willing to contribute their data set uh, to the algorithm that is analyzing uh, the data. So how do we obtain differential privacy in machine learning? Well, there are a number of approaches that have been introduced. Uh, the canonical approach is now uh, differentially private stochastic graded descent, but I'm going to introduce Pate here, which is another framework that we previously introduced for learning with differential privacy because it makes it very easy and intuitive to understand some of the beneficial properties of differential privacy. So how does Pate work? Well, we take a data set that we'd like to learn from with privacy, and then we split that data set in n partitions here. So what this means is that these are mathematical partitions in the sense that there is no overlap in the data between the different partitions. From each of these partitions, we'll then train a machine learning model that we'll call the teacher, and you'll understand why later. But the, the key here is that each of these teachers is trained independently from the corresponding uh, data partition, which means that we have an ensemble of n models that are uh, basically trained independently uh, from different data sets. Now, how do we have this ensemble predict? Well, the naive thing to do would be to ask these teachers to vote on predictions. So we could, for instance, if we have a classification problem, we could uh, give a test input to each of the teachers, ask them for which class they would vote for, and then build a histogram of uh, the votes that the teacher submitted and output the class that received the most number of votes, the argmax of that histogram. However, if we do this, uh, we might still be able to leak some private information. To understand why, you can see how one data uh, partition changing can change the outcome of the argmax if we have about the same number of votes for two different classes. What this would mean is that one teacher changing its vote from one class to the second would possibly change the argmax uh, that we're computing over the histogram of votes. And so what that would mean is that if my data here was included in this data set and then included, for instance, in uh, the partition number two, then the teacher number two changing its prediction might leak uh, information about me because the argmax is changing. And so this is where randomization comes in uh, to preserve privacy and is essential to obtain the guarantee of differential privacy for this algorithm. Um, and the idea is that we're going to randomly perturb the uh, vote counts in the histogram before we take the argmax. And this will introduce this notion of indistinguishability that I was discussing here meaning that if the adversary is observing the noisy argmax and uh, notices that the output of the noisy argmax is changing when the data uh, has been changed here, then it will not know whether this change is indeed because the data was changed or because we simply uh, sampled different random numbers that were added to the histogram. And so once we have this noisy argmax over the histogram of teacher votes, we are able to obtain differential privacy. And the predictions are, uh, again, each prediction made by the noisy argmax is privacy preserving. The one caveat with this is that every time that the ensemble of teachers makes a prediction, it potentially increases the uh, amount of private information that is leaking because we are bounding how much private information is leaking from each of uh, the predictions made by the noisy argmax, but this bound is not zero. And so what this means is as the noisy argmax reveals more and more 
predictions, it's the, the total privacy cost is going to increase. And so we have to find a way to limit how many times we are going to query the teachers uh, for a prediction. The way that we do this is uh, by training another model, the student model, and this is where the teacher student model names come from. And this model is going to learn from public data. So we'll take public data that is on label. So it should be hopefully easier to collect than the sensitive data that was labeled. And then we're going to send some of this public data to the ensemble of teachers and ask the teachers to label that public data. And so they will do so using the noisy argmax, which means that if the student then trains on this uh, labeled uh, public data, it will be able to transfer the knowledge that was contained in the ensemble of teachers uh, into the student model uh, with privacy guarantees, because again, each of these labels that the teachers are going to produce using the noisy argmax uh, come with differential privacy guarantees. Next, I'd like to show you why differential privacy is such an elegant definition. What you will see is that if we look at this pate setup, it shows how differential privacy aligns the uh, desire to obtain privacy with the goal of machine learning, which is to obtain models that generalize well to new data samples. Why is that the case? Let's come back to this ensemble setup here. What you'll notice is that when most of the teacher uh, models agree on the prediction, when we have strong consensus among the uh, ensemble of teachers, then what this means is this prediction is more likely to be correct, right? Because this prediction was made from multiple models that were independently trained uh, from different sources of data. But what it also means when we have this strong consensus is that we can produce the uh, label through the noisy argmax with stronger differential privacy guarantees, meaning a smaller bound epsilon. And why is that the case? Well, when we have stronger consensus, the histogram of votes is going to have a large gap between the most common label and the runner up. And so what this means is when we perturb this histogram with random noise, then we are less likely to change the outcome of the noisy argmax. And so we can introduce more noise and as a consequence, obtain stronger uh, indistinguishability, stronger differential privacy guarantees. Okay. And this is in fact something we exploded in a follow-up paper here, where we showed that we can simultaneously increase the accuracy of pate and the privacy of pate by enforcing a minimum level of consensus among the teachers before we reveal their predictions. And so this was a very rare uh, case where we were able to simultaneously improve the privacy and the utility of the algorithm. The second advantage of differential privacy is that the definition is agnostic to the adversary's capabilities and knowledge. And so what this means is that we have robustness to adaptive attacks baked in the definition of differential privacy. And this is in very strong and sharp contrast with the first part of this talk where I showed how we were not able to uh, defend against um, adversarial examples uh, that were designed using adaptive attack strategies. Uh, and so here what we'll see is that instead when we train models with differential privacy, we are able to uh, sustain the robustness, uh, which here is uh, privacy, in the face of uh, new adaptive uh, attack strategies. So let me illustrate this here with a simple example. In uh, the field of privacy, a very common attack against the privacy of training data is uh, to uh, question whether a point was int introduced in the training set or not. This is known as membership inference. The adversary has access to a particular input and wants to know whether the input was included in the training set or not. How did a lot of attacks uh, work initially? Well, they looked at the confidence of the model and more or less, if we simplify, uh, decided that the point is more likely to be part of the training set if the confidence of the model is uh, higher on this point, okay? And so 
what uh, did a number of defenses uh, propose? Well, let's hide the confidence of the model or mask the confidence of the model so that these attack strategies now fail. And so this is something that we looked at in, in this paper here on the right. And what we did is we decided let's try to build an attack, a membership inference attack that only requires access to the labels predicted by the model. And so this is what we did. And we then compared the performance of this attack here in the orange dotted line to the performance of an attack that used the confidence predicted by the model, which is the blue line. And you can see that both of these attacks perform equally well. So what does this mean for our defenses that we're masking confidence? Well, they are broken because essentially all we have to do is switch to the label only attack and these defenses are de facto broken. Okay, and this is where we can see that differential privacy brings us a significant advantage here in the sense that it does not make any assumptions about what the adversary is able to do or knows. And so what we found in fact in this paper is that if we evaluate these different defenses and compare them to training with differential privacy, so for instance, training with pate or training with differentially private stochastic gradient descent, well, training with differential privacy provides robustness to the new attacks that are label only, uh, which is a given uh, by the definition, which is again, agnostic to the adversary's capabilities and knowledge. And not only was it robust, it actually provides the best trade-off between accuracy and robustness among these different defenses. And so here, this is again, uh, I think a clear demonstration of how differential privacy is successfully introducing randomness in our machine learning algorithms to provide very strong guarantees that are robust to adaptive adversaries, uh, which is very different from what we saw in the field of adversarial examples, where it is not clear yet that we can use randomization to improve the robustness of machine learning models to adversarial examples. And so to give another example, let me show you what happens when we don't use uh, randomness in uh, machine learning and we try to obtain privacy guarantees uh, without randomness. So this will be another example to illustrate why differential privacy is necessary. And so here what I'm going to look at is federated learning, which is an approach that has been proposed uh, to uh, provide some privacy guarantees to the user uh, without uh, initially relying on differential privacy. And so this vanilla form of federated learning uh, is essentially doing the following. It's sending a particular machine learning model to different clients that each possess uh, a specific data set that they have access to. And rather than having these clients send back their data uh, to the central server to train uh, and continue training this, this model, the central server simply asks the client to compute model updates, to compute gradients um, on their local data, and then to send those updates, to send those gradients back to the central server. And so the idea here is that uh, we obtain some form of data minimization where rather than uh, sending the data directly to the central server, the different clients are only sending updates and gradients that are computed using their data. And so to, to illustrate why this does not provide privacy uh, to the user if the central server is untrusted, look at these images on the right where we have here the original training points that were um, uh, stored at the different clients' uh, locations. And here, this is the extracted images that the central server is able to recover from the updates that these different clients sent. And again, the same type of example here, but this time with text, where we have the original text sample and the extracted text sample. And so what we are showing you here is that the gradients or the updates contain exactly the training points that the clients were hoping to protect by not sending those points directly to the central server. And this is something that we demonstrated in this paper here when the curious abandoned honesty federated learning is not private, 
uh, which is work that is led by Francisca Bunish, and I'm going to use her slides here to illustrate how the approach works. So to understand why we are able to extract these data points from the gradients, it's useful to look at what these gradients are. And so here we have these uh, definitions, which is simply to say we are computing the gradient of the loss, which is the error of the model with respect to the weights and the biases. Okay. And so if we look, for instance, at a fully connected layer, the first fully connected layer that a model would have with here, the, uh, the input being the image itself, then what a neuron is computing is the application of an activation function to the weighted sum uh, between uh, sort of the input and the parameters of the model. And so in particular, if we use the ReLU activation function, anytime that we have a positive input, a positive weighted sum, then the output of the neuron will simply be the weighted sum itself. And so if we look at the gradients themselves and we massage their expressions a little bit, we can see that the gradient of the loss with respect to the weight is the gradient of the loss with respect to the bias times the input itself. Okay. And so what this means is that the central server knows both the gradient of the loss with respect to the weight and the gradient of the loss with respect to the bias. So the central server can recover the input simply by uh, canceling out the factor here, which is one of the gradients, uh, in the first gradient itself. And so this means that if the adversary wants to recover, the central server wants to recover these data points, all they have to do is this simple computation, and then they can directly plot the input and, and visualize it. So one catch with this is that typically gradients here of the loss with respect to the weights are not computed on individual data points, but rather on mini batches that contain multiple training points. And so what this means is that we have in fact a sum, a summation over the different inputs that we're including, this different uh, training points that we're including, uh, before we return the gradient back to the central server. But what is surprising is that if we look at the gradients and we plot them, uh, for instance, using matplotlib, we can see that after we apply the rescaling operation that I discussed here, that we still can, we can still recover individual training examples for some of the cases here, whereas some of the other training examples have been obfuscated because we have applied this summation. So why is this possible? Well, it turns out that some of the neurons are only activated by an individual training example, whereas some of the neurons are activated by multiple training examples. And so in cases where multiple training examples are activating a neuron, we get a gradient after rescaling that is essentially uh, very difficult to interpret and to recover the training example from. However, when we have a single training example uh, activating a particular neuron, then we basically get a summation which is made up of a bunch of zeros and the gradient corresponding to that individual training point. And so this is where we can recover these images perfectly, despite the fact that the gradient is being computed over multiple data points. Okay, and so what this means uh, to the particular users here is that they are not able to obtain privacy as long as they cannot trust the central server uh, in, uh, in the sense that the central server will not try to recover their training data from these individual gradients. And this is, again, the pure form of federated learning, the sort of first vanilla approach to it that was uh, provided without any form of differential privacy. If we do want to obtain privacy, we then need to combine differential privacy uh, with the federated learning protocol. And this is not as easy as we would think, um, in particular when, again, the central server is not trusted. And so what I'm showing here is what is required uh, in order for the attack uh, to be prevented. And you can see that if we introduce a differentially private optimizer, uh, such as uh, differentially private stochastic gradient descent, which is both clipping and noising 
for example, gradients to obtain privacy, you can see that indeed, as we increase randomization, then we do get this differential privacy guarantee. And so we are able to prevent the inputs, the training examples from being reconstructed in this differentially private federated learning protocol. However, calibrating this randomness is very tricky. Uh, and this is because here it is difficult for an individual client to trust that the other clients are also clipping and noising their gradients accordingly to the differentially private optimizers needs. And if we want to ensure that we can uh, introduce some cryptographic primitives, but at the end of the day, if this, uh, the user, the clients are unable to trust the central server, then an individual user, an individual client cannot trust that the central server selected other real clients in the mini batch that is being computed. And so what this means is that these other clients could very well be uh, sending back zeros as their individual gradients. And so when we would sum across this uh, mini match of training examples, then we would basically expose the client that we're uh, caring about that is unable to trust these other clients. And so what this means is that if as a user, I'm not able to trust the central server that is deploying federated learning, then I need to clip and noise my gradients, assuming that other users would not do that properly. And so essentially I have to fall back to a model of differential privacy, which is called local differential privacy, where I'm obtaining the guarantee independently for my own training data. And so this means that I have to introduce more noise uh, to the gradients before I send them back to the central server, which makes it difficult for the central server to get any utility from these, this procedure. And so through this example, what I wanted to show you is that even if we combine all of our advances in both cryptography and differential privacy and machine learning, it is still difficult to obtain privacy guarantees in the case where the users do not trust the central server deploying federated learning. And it shows how key randomization is to obtain privacy because the, the, the key of the question for why we cannot have this nice trade-off between privacy and utility is because we are not sure as a user how to calibrate how much noise is being added to the gradients such that we are uh, we have guarantees that our training data is being protected and so before i conclude i'd like to take a minute to advertise the new conference on secure and trustworthy machine learning that we are starting together with patrick mcdaniel and a whole number of uh, researchers from the trustworthy machine learning community uh, this conference is sponsored by the IEEE and will happen in February uh, next year, 2023. I highly encourage you to consider participating in some of the competitions that are held before the conference or to attend the conference if you are interested in this area. To conclude this talk, if you'd like to remember one takeaway message, the idea is that randomization in robustness is still poorly understood and we don't know exactly how to calibrate and how to add noise to machine learning model classifiers in order to make them more robust to adversarial examples. Instead, in the field of privacy, we do have uh, an elegant way to use randomization as a way to improve the privacy of machine learning models, and this is known as the framework of differential privacy. There are still some open questions in the area of privacy, but they relate more to how to calibrate the noise that is provided and the guarantee that is obtained for end users, in particular in the cases where we are learning machine learning models in decentralized frameworks. With this, I'd like to thank all of my students and postdocs for their contributions to the research that I presented today, uh, and I'd be happy to take questions uh, if you have any.